One of the best to ever strap himself into a sprint car is our guest this week on Inside Track. Doug Wolfgang joins us. Doug, thanks for the time. You're welcome, very welcome. Thanks for having me. I've been hearing this rumor during the off season, Doug Wolfgang back in a sprint car. And I've been thinking to myself, wow, how cool would that be? Is that true? My wife didn't think of it that way when she read that in the paper. <laughs> uh, it, 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 is, it is not true. There are, there's a couple reasons. I got invited to go to a couple races this summer, uh, which one now is gonna be delayed till next summer, and that's more or less a you know, a promoted deal where they just having a bunch of old, retired, retro drivers show up and I don't have to race to win, I just mostly have to parade around the racetrack and thrill the fans a little bit. Probably thrill me more than the fans. But I told her if I was going to do that a couple times this summer, I wanted to at least start Robbie's car a couple times and make a few laps, so I will a couple nights. I haven't yet, but I will. Looking forward to it. You and Robbie involved in the IMCA 305 Race Saver class. What's the future of that class? It's a class of the future. There's no way these young guys at 18 or 19 years old, who, who, which most of them don't have aspirations to be around cars, let alone race cars anymore, that's, that's high tech world of computers and what have you, they go other directions. But the ones who do, obviously can't even afford to buy a left front tire on a race car. They cost so much, especially like in the 410 class when the motors are 55, 60,000. A young kid driving a $2,000 beat up old Honda or whatever, they can't afford that. And so the, the kids can't get involved now to, to even find out if they want to go to a more of a high level like a 410 level or maybe even a stock car or an Indy car level, they have nowhere to go so they give up and don't even come out there. So I like the class. It's a class where they can get involved in local short track racing and be and not spend a million dollars to do it. They could probably, we, we have a car and we've spent a little less than 10,000 on the whole thing so far and and it's not a perfect car. It's not hi-fi car but it, you can have as much fun racing it because they're all the same speed they have enough rules to keep the class in order enough to where you can't just outspend somebody that has 10 million uh, can't take his 10 million and outspend there are only so many things you can do to it and I like that especially for the young guys who would like to do it it seems like the 360 class and the 410 class, for that matter, is getting harder and harder to find weekly shows with those classes. Is that something that race fans should be concerned about? Well, the race fans are concerned about it because they go to a race, especially by midsummer to late summer, before football starts, to where they want to go to an entertainment, uh, some entertainment, and the first thing they find out is there's a class of cars that only has seven or eight cars there. Well, without a number of cars, two or three, eight, you know, se seven, eight, ten car heat races, and then a 24 car or 20, 24 car main event, you can't really put on a good show for the crowd. And they, they don't understand it. Well, the biggest thing is, is that they, what they don't understand is the motors take, take 30, 35,000 for a, even a 360 motor and they're racing for a thousand or so less or more or less to win and the 410 motors are 50 plus thousand dollars and they say well you don't have to have that much money well it's not fun just to race you want to have a chance at least in your mind to win one or two and after a while if you don't have a chance you'll just go home as a competitor and, or the motor will blow up and you have no chance of rebuilding the motor and getting it together for less than 12, 14,000 and nobody has 14,000 just to throw away at one chunk. So all of a sudden, by the middle of the summer, the, class, the car counts are down to six, seven, eight cars and it's not a show. What they're trying to do with the 305 class is to eliminate that problem because it's a lower budget lower budget engine, a lower, it's still sprint cars, still the same type of cars to look at. And I, and, uh, I think it will get to that. And then when those kids become good enough, if 
and want to do it enough, then they can progress and go to the next level of racing to whatever level they want to go. If they want to go to the Knoxville national level, then they'll go to 410 and go on to that level. Sure. There's been some guys with some pretty big pocketbooks stepping up lately. Tony Stewart, of course, buying Eldora Speedway uh, a while back, and then the All-Star Circuit of Champions. Todd Queering buying Jackson Speedway, starting up the National Sprint League. Chuck Brennan stepping up and buying Houston Speedway. Do you like that trend? Yeah, well, naturally we all do. I, but, I, but I'm one of the very few guys I've noticed around town by talking to people that I like change. I think change is good in anything. I like the changes that they make in rules in the NFL. I like the changes that they make in the, in the NBA. And I definitely like changes. Uh, you know, when they get complacent in NASCAR, they change the rules right on the spot. I think it's a good deal. It keeps everybody guessing. It keeps, the, it keeps, it keeps them going. The only reason I don't like it is if it costs the racers too much money. Uh, but I think these guys understand, the first thing they understand is, they need to put on a good show and to sell that show to the crowd so that they can make money. They got to have people in the grandstand. They need to, they need to do something for the racers to get, to get them to put on a good show. And part of that would be to, to have more prize money and more, more reasons to come race. All right, a little fun with you, Doug. I'm going to give you a couple names and I want you to give me your first impression and just maybe a short little thought about these people. Steve Kinzer. He's, he's, he's older now and a, and a bit out of shape, which everybody can see now. But trust me, he's the toughest son of a gun I've ever been around in my life. He used to could hold me up by my, by my collar and my belly button and hold me straight over his head. That's hard to do, 170 pounds, 180 pounds of dead weight. Right. He could do that when he was 25 years old, easy. Well, Sammy Swindell. Sammy is the most intense person you'll ever meet in your life. He's a nice guy. I particularly, we raced together for several years and have known each other for no, almost 40 and we've never spoken to each other but about five words. And that sounds bad, but I would still probably, I would probably list him in my top five best friends. Don't even, and we never spoke a word. I admire him. Founder of the World of Outlaws, Ted Johnson. Ted, there isn't a day goes by that I don't think about Ted, and everybody knows that I had a lawsuit against the World of Outlaws when I got burnt, and I won the lawsuit. Uh, but there isn't a day that goes by that I don't think about Ted, because without him, I probably wouldn't be here today. He made racing a two, three hundred dollar a night hobby deal become a national phenomenon in a matter of a few years. I won the first I won the first 10,000 win race, the first 20,000 win race, the first 25,000 and I and I got I didn't win the first 50, but I won the second one. Longtime race promoter at Knoxville Raceway Ralph Capitani. Ralph was a fair guy and he treated me more than fair all the years I was there for somebody who grew up being a football coach. To be that strong in racing is saying a lot about a person. Doug Wolfgang. I'd say I was, I'd say that I was the, uh, as, as intense in my own way as Sammy was, but I wasn't intense, as intent as he was with the mechanics of the race. I was intent on being the best athlete that I could be to drive these race cars. If it took losing 30 pounds, I lost 30 pounds. If it took being able to last in a race car, being able to run five miles a day, 365 days a year, I ran five miles a day, 365 days a year. It was the only thing, to me, it was the only thing I had going for me as a kid, to be the best I could be athlete as a race driver. I was sure I wasn't gonna be no NBA player or an NFL player. <laughs> I didn't have a butt as big as Kirby Puckett, so I couldn't hit a baseball. <laughs> Being a dad, this is one of the most surreal scenes that I've ever had a chance to witness at a racetrack, and I don't know if many people even noticed it except me. One night, Houston Speedway down inside number one corner, a couple of guys that I cheered for as a kid, Doug Wolfgang and Marlon Jones standing next to each other talking, watching their kids race at Houston Speedway. What's it like to watch your kid race? 
It's not that big a deal for me because I got hurt right at the end of my career and I spent a long time in the hospital and several, several hundred thousand dollars to uh, heal myself and a lot of time. And, and so I got, the bi I got to be the biggest of the biggest in my sport. I shake hands with Mario Andretti, uh, Richard Petty, A.J. Foyt, and Dale Earnhardt. I, I've, I have kids idolize me like Tony Stewart, Jeff Gordon, and, and which there are not kids no more. They are, they're at the tail end of their careers now, getting towards there. In fact, Jeff's retiring this year. And so I see the highest of the highs, but I also see the lowest of the lows. So the one thing I remember with my kid the most is, is that if he likes it, I'm all for it. I want to be with him and I want to help him as much as I can, but he has to do it. And, and to me, it's a feature win for him if I get in my street car or a pickup or whatever, I drove to the track and we drive away. I don't care if he wins, loses, or draws. If we drive away and go home that night and nobody's hurt, him, if he's not hurt, it's a win to me. How emotional was it the night that you were inducted into the Houston Speedway Hall of Fame and Robbie won his first race on the same night? Well, that was pretty cool. I think it was more cool for him because it was, he was 16, I think, at the time. And uh, it, you probably don't understand this, but he was 15 before he knew I was a race driver. He never really, I don't have no trophies, no helmets, no, no uh, uniforms, no not. I've given them all away to different, uh, you know, all my Knoxville National trophies, everything are given away. So he just was always out here at the shop. He knew who I, he knew I built race cars and all the big guys with Donnie Schatz would come and Steve Kinder would be around and, you know, uh, uh, Tyler Walker used to take him to the roller skate, you know, to the skateboarding uh, rank and all that stuff. So he just thought, oh, well, that's cool, you know, that's just the way it is. Well, he got to be about 15 years old and we went to uh, uh, the biggest pro-am, uh, the biggest amateur motocross event in the country he qualified for in Hurricane Hills, Tennessee at Loretta Lynn's Ranch. It's called Loretta Lynn's and it's just the big, it's like the Daytona 500 of amateur motocross. He qualifies for it, which is, which is in itself all right. And we leave there to come home from there, but we had to go by the publisher's place that, that, that uh, the uh, author Dave Argebreiter wrote a book about me. They were having the books published and it was two weeks before the Knoxville National, so it was like the first of August. We had to go by there to sign 3,000 pre pre-sold books so they could send them out before we took them to the Knoxville Nationals to have, you know, to, for me to personally meet and greet people and sign books, a book signing. And at that point, he didn't know who I was, and his hero was Ricky Carmichael, the GOAT, the greatest of all time motorcycle rider, because that's all he did. So they, they, gave him, they gave him a book at this thing, and he's 15 years old, 14 years old, going on 15. We're in a little motorhome, we're coming home from Indianapolis and gonna go back down to Knoxville. And we drive down the road three or four hours and he's reading this book and he taps me on the shoulder and this is my son who never asked me one word about racing, never, and I never said nothing. We live it, we eat it, we breathe it, but we ne I never said nothing about being all, all right or kind of good or winning or something. He says, uh, Dad, you kind of like, you're kind of like Ricky Carmichael, aren't you? I said, what do you mean? He said, man, you're the GOAT. You've won everything. I said, well, Robbie, no, I'm not the GOAT, but I am your dad. Yeah. And so a week later, he goes with me down to Knoxville at this book signing. He comes with me one night. Not, I was there two or three different nights. And there's a, there's a lot, we drive by and I go to the Hall of Fame out in the back off turn two. And they got this brick wall with all the winners of the thing on this, of the big race, the Knoxville Nationals on this brick wall. And my name's on it five times. He said, Dad, your name's on that thing five times. I said, yeah, I guess I never seen it before. They just made it. He said, look at that line of people. I wonder what they're waiting for. They were lined up all the way down Highway 14 from turn two to turn one and into behind the grandstand there. 
And we're walking through that line. We're going up front. We made the corner, and he stopped, and he looks. He said, there's Mom and Dave at that table, and all them people are lying. Dad, those people are waiting for you. I said, no, Rob, they're waiting to meet you. They know who I am. <laughs> I said, come down there and sign autographs with me. So he's there for a couple hours signing autographs, and he just thought he was King Kong. You know, but he didn't know that he didn't know that race fans actually knew who I was. Wow. That was, it was, that's the most exciting thing that I've, that I experienced. I loved him winning that race out here, but, uh, but he was more excited about it than I was. And this is no cut to Houston's, but by the time I, they put me in their Hall of Fame, which I really, I thank them a lot, I already was put in about 10 Hall of Fame, so it wasn't that I hadn't done it before, but I hadn't done it with my, my son there. Well. The Houston Speedway will be transforming into Badlands Motor Speedway next year. You've had a chance to sit down and talk with Chuck Brennan. Give me your impressions of not only the changes that you see coming, but maybe Chuck in general. Well, my first impression was when I read it in the paper and heard it on the news, I thought, man, you know, you think of these guys' dollar loan centers and all this. You, my first impression is I wonder what kind of a sleazy guy this guy really is. When, when he came out here to my shop and met me face to face and we talked for an hour or so, the first thing that changed in me was he wasn't sleazy at all. He was just like me. He was a family guy that had a family. They live in Las Vegas. His mother and father live here in town. He loves coming home to Sioux Falls. He loves being around his mom and dad and I admired that right off so he got my admiration right away and as far as the name change as far as changing it to you know whatever the name's going to be is it Badlands Badlands Motor Speedway Badlands Motor Speedway I understand he's promoting a thing and it's going to go along with the promotion and maybe most people are not into this, but I am. I, li I like change. I think change is. I think change is better, even if it's worse. I think it's better. Stag stagnant things don't go nowhere. It seems like there's a fine line with him that he wants progression and change, but he also has appreciation for the past. He d he does, and that's one of the reasons why he came out here. He he had a Doug Wolfgang T-shirt when he went to high school, and he he's. I think he said he was 47 and I'm 63, so obviously I'm older than him and didn't go to school with him, but about the time he would have been in high school would have been in the middle of my heyday when, when in those days everybody in town wore, or, or for that fact, everybody in the Midwest, well, that don't even matter, everybody had Doug Wolfgang t-shirts. And uh, you know, it was a big deal in them days before tens of other types of entertainment came along. And uh, and so he just wanted to meet. He 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 wanted to meet Doug Wolfgang. He didn't want me. He didn't wasn't asking me for nothing. He wasn't trying to get me to do anything. He wasn't trying to lever me around. He just wanted to gain a little appreciation for the sport of auto racing. And one way that he thought he could gain that was maybe see uh, somebody who was retired that had had a little bit of knowledge or whatever uh, experience with it, and, and I admired that. Doug, thanks for the time. Always good to see you. The best in the business. He is the only South Dakota race car driver in the South Dakota Sports Hall of Fame. He's a Houston Speedway Hall of Famer, a National Hall of Famer. He's our guest this week, Doug Wolfgang, and this has been Inside Track.